So I'll, I'll give you a few minutes while they're uh, they're handing out the uh, the printouts, which is what you're doing, right? Yes. Or did they do it already? Ooh, so quick. Also, you should have uh, a copy of the discussion points too, right? This little piece of paper somewhere. You have? Yeah, yeah okay. Huh? Is it the same one? Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, same what, same what I said this morning. These are the discussion points. So you know. So this lecture is going to be difficult to do because I don't have enough time. Uh, when talking about uh, principles about the spirit world, uh, it's a huge, huge subject. Uh, and the other problem is one of my favorite subjects, so uh, I have to limit myself. But uh, we might go right to the limit of the time. Uh, essentially, what you have to get out of it, what you have to come to understand among many, many things you can learn here, is what is the purpose and value of our physical life. Uh, we didn't get into this so much, but if you look at our last few lectures, um, and if you look in the principle, you'll see these two things are often together, purpose and value. In fact, in the principle of creation, you have one section that talks about the purpose of creation, and the very next section talks about the original value. Uh, it's important to, to remember this, because especially here, okay, purpose and value of physical life. Whose life are we talking about? Yours. And the purpose that you fulfill or not will determine the value or not of your life. This is maybe something we don't often think of consciously, but it is something that we do have a sense of, consciously or not, is your own self-worth or value. That's why even one of, one of the questions that I put on here as, uh, for discussion uh, is the very first one, to give example of how you find, find your value in bringing joy to your parents or to God, or how you don't find your value. The idea is, you know, we all, through fulfilling our purpose or not, this is how we get a sense of our own self-worth. Our own, our sense of self-worth decides the way we lead our life. Bottom line. If you have a sense of your own value, you will go in a certain direction. If you don't feel your own value, you will go in a very, very different direction. Very most simp simplest example, you know, if you have, say you have, a, uh, you have a pen, and the purpose of the pen is to write. And if you want to write, and you have a pen that writes, would you say that this pen has value? Yeah, you'll keep it, because it works, it writes. It has a purpose, and it, it can fulfill that purpose, it has value. But well, what happens if you need to write? You have a pen that is empty. The pen does not write. In this circumstance, does this pen serve a purpose? Can it fulfill a purpose? No, it can't write. What do you do with a pen that can't write? You throw it away because it has no value. Now it's very simplistic, but when it comes to human life, we do the same. When people have a sense of their own self-worth, their own value, they will live their life in a certain way. If people don't have a sense of their own value, what will they do? They throw their life away. This is why people do drugs. This is why people become alcoholic. This is why people will even turn to crime. This is why people will turn to free sex. And of course, this is why people will commit suicide. It's all the same. They don't have a sense of their own value. And it comes down to what they didn't know 
is that they weren't able to fulfill a purpose. Usually because they didn't know what it was. So this is important. A lot of times when we talk about purpose of life, you know, it's something that no one has ever really been able to answer very well, so it became almost a joke. Purpose of life, meaning of life. Um, in fact, anyone ever see, there's a, there's a whole comedy movie done by these British guys, Monty Python. It's called The Meaning of Life. The whole movie is a comedy. Because no one's ever really been able to answer it, so they, you know, you don't have an answer for it, so the best thing to do is make a joke about it. But it's not a joke, and it's not, and it's not an abstract thing. It's not an abstract philosophical thing. It's an everyday, real-life thing. If we're living according to this purpose or not, if we're fulfilling this purpose or not. And it's something we have to start to, to consciously think about, because it'll decide the way you live your life. Okay? So first, talking about the reality of the spirit world. How do we know that a spirit world exists? Especially if you've never been there. I'm assuming that most of you have never been there. Because if you've been there, you wouldn't be here right now. So in the principle it says, the universe was created after the pattern of a human being, who himself is in the image of God's dual characteristics. Uh, as man was meant to be the mediator for everything to come to God, so everything was made in man's image. So corresponding to human mind and body, universe consists of an incorporeal world, which we call the spirit world, or the corporeal world, the physical world, both of which are real and substantial. Even though one is incorporeal, means you don't see it, it's there, it's real. And, and it corresponds to like our mind and body. So we say, in the principle, we use this term cosmos. In you know outside world, it might have a different different meaning, but in principle terminology, we use the word cosmos relating to spirit world and physical world. Whenever we're talking about these two together, spirit world and physical world, we use the term cosmos. So we say that there's a spiritual world and a physical world. These correspond to like our mind and body. Spiritual world is a world of cause. Physical world is a world of effect or result. Spirit world is infinite and eternal. And the physical world is finite and temporal. Means it's limited by time and space. So it's like your physical body. All right, your physical body can exist in one place at one time, as much as we hate the idea. Your body can only be in one place at a time. Your mind is not limited like that, actually. Right? You guys could be here, right? You could be sitting here right now, your body is here, but your mind could actually be back in bed, sleeping. <laughs> Although it shouldn't be. It's possible. Uh, your body is here now, but your mind could be remembering the past. You could be thinking of the past, right? Of when you were in bed sleeping. Or imagining the future of when finally you get to go back to bed and go to sleep again. Hopefully nobody's doing that right now. I'm assuming we'll have this difficulty. It's the after lunch, after sports, all my blood is going to my stomach time. So we'll, we'll have to fight with this, okay? If you feel yourself falling asleep, Stand on your head, and your blood will go back to your brain. <clears throat> so like this, you know, your body has these limitations of time and space. The physical world is also like that, limited by time and space. Your mind is not limited in that way. In the same way, the spirit world does not have those limitations. It's infinite and eternal. Now, how do we, how do we experience the physical world? We have five physical senses. So you can see it, you can feel it. Taste it, touch it, hear it. How do you experience the spirit world? Well, you should. You should be able to experience the spirit world through five spiritual senses. It means you see and you hear and you taste and you touch and you smell spiritual things. But we don't, we don't notice that, do we? <laughs> When's the last time you smelled something spiritually? Uh, 
not really sure, <laughs> maybe. Uh, sometimes maybe you kind of sort of thought you heard something, or kind of sort of saw something, or maybe thought you felt something, maybe, kind of, sort of, maybe it was my imagination. Um, problem with us as fallen man is our spiritual senses became broken, you know, and we can't relate to spirit world so clearly anymore. So that's why we have what everyone refers to as a sixth sense. You know, we have five physical ones, and then what is a sixth sense? What does it refer to? Something spiritual. There should be a six, a seven, eight, nine, and ten, but we're so messed up, we're lucky we kind of sort of have a sixth something. Um, it should be more clear than that. Reality is, if man had not fallen, if man had not fallen, we would relate to spiritual world as clearly as we relate to the physical world. Has anyone ever thought of this? You know the fall of man story, right? Anybody ever, you know, the Adam and Eve, Adam, Eve, Archangel story? You know this? Think about this. Eve was talking to the Archangel. They had lots of conversations. Eve had a sexual relationship with the Archangel. Angel's just a spiritual being. How could that be? Because even, even at their spiritual level, Adam and Eve's spiritual senses were completely open. Eve could talk to this angel, this spiritual being, Lucifer, see him, talk to him, feel him, no different than a physical person. That's what it used to be like. Now, quite different. Now our spiritual senses are very much dulled and deadened, which is what makes it hard for us to realize or accept that there is, you know, a spirit world. For some of you, I don't know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. <laughs> Everybody close their eyes and then, you know, if you really don't really believe in spirit world, raise your hand. And then I'll tell your team captain afterwards. But it's understandable, it's hard, you know, if you didn't have any experience. Um, but just in case you still are skeptical, or if you still talk to people who are skeptical, okay? If people say, well, there's no scientific evidence of it, it's a lie. It's really a lie. There's actually quite a bit of scientific evidence of it. Scientific means through scientific method or process, they've proven it. Um, I'll give you a few, a few examples. There's one, one man, uh, his name was Arthur Ford. Arthur Ford was a, a medium. Now a medium is a guy who, for whatever reason, uh, his body becomes a channel for some spirit to work through. Sometimes speak through, sometimes, you know, communicate by writing. And what the mediums usually do is, say if they have what they call a sitting or a seance with a person. Whatever spirits are related or connected to this person will come to the medium and communicate to the person in spirit world. This person in spirit world becomes like, you know, an MC and expresses everything through the physical body of the medium. You know, your grandmother came and she's telling me this and this and your grandfather's here telling me this. He's like, you know, the MC for this, you know, family reunion, and he communicates it through the medium, through Arthur Ford in this case. Um, Ford himself wrote many books about all these experiences at as a medium, and every one of his books had the same, same purpose, just to show people that there is life and spirit world. Not what it's like, just that it exists, that when people die physically, they still live on. That's all he ever wanted to prove. And he had example after example after example. And he said it was very frustrating because for some people, no matter what examples you presented to them, they didn't want to accept it. Even you proved it to them, they didn't want to believe it. It's not that they couldn't, it's that they didn't want to. But one of his stories, what, the thing that made him famous, and this was in the early, I guess, early 1900s, there was a famous magician uh, 
or escape artist. His name was Harry Houdini. Have you ever heard that name? Houdini? Uh, he was, you know, he's one of these guys, you know, he would wrap himself in chains and then get into this, you know, this uh, glass box with water in it and then, you know, escape. Except for the last time he didn't escape. Um, <laughs> that's how he died. Uh, but before he died, you know, Houdini's mother died. And Houdini loved his mother very much. And Houdini really wanted to know if there was life after death. He wanted to communicate with his mother. And actually, he had arranged with his mother that she would give him a message, a one-word message. You know, if you were to communicate to me after, from the afterlife, give me this message and I'll know it's you. One word. And only Houdini and his wife and his mother knew this. And uh, so he went all over the place trying to find some medium who could help him communicate with his mother, and it was not successful. And eventually he got very upset. He hated all mediums. He decided that they're all fake. And he went around trying to disprove them all and prove them as fakes, and you know, he became very, very bitter. But before he died, he and his wife set up something similar, a certain message, that if either one of them died, you know, if you try to communicate from afterlife, this is the message, and then I'll know it's you. But this message was even more complicated. It was not just a word, it was an entire phrase that was in code. You know, he had a magic act and his wife was his assistant. So they had a certain code, you know, that they used during the magic act. She would say this and then he would know she, she meant that. So this was a code that only Houdini and his wife knew, a message in code that only Houdini's wife knew. And if anyone not knowing this code received this message, they would have no idea what. It doesn't even make sense. It's not even a lot, it doesn't, you know, it's not even normal sentences. So Houdini died. His wife let everyone publicly know that he, she's looking for any medium who can, you know, give her this message from her husband. Of course, she didn't tell him what the message was. And of course, everyone's calling, say, oh yeah, I got a message from your husband from the afterlife. Yes, he, uh, he says he loves you, um, he, uh, uh, his message is he misses you and wishes you were there. Um, so she can just easily ignore it because it was clearly not that message. Well, one day, when the medium Arthur Ford was having a sitting with some other person, that MC spirit, his name was, I'll tell you his name so I don't go crazy explaining it, the spirit's name was Fletcher. So Fletcher left a message with the guys who were there, please tell Ford Please tell him when he wakes up that I have a message for him from Houdini. So Ford woke up and they said, wow, you know, Fletcher said he's got a message for you from Houdini. And he's like, no, thank you. Because before Houdini died, he went around discrediting all these mediums. And some of them were Ford's friends. They were actually were good people. And so he's like, Houdini? No, thank you. I don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, my friends got burned by Houdini and they lost their jobs. That's, no, thanks. I'm not touching it. Um, but his friends were kind of curious, so they called Mrs. Houdini. And the uh, Fletcher actually left a one word, left this one word. You know, I got a message from Houdini and this, you know, there's this one word. So friends called Mrs. Houdini and said, you know, I, you know, we represent the medium Arthur Ford and he received this message that it was said it was from Houdini and it's this one word, do you recognize this? And she went, <gasps> that word was the message from Houdini's mother that no one had been able to reveal yet. She says, who's this Arthur Ford? I want to meet him, you know. <laughs> and then the friends had to tell Ford, yeah, you know, Mrs. Houdini, she wants to meet you. He's like, what? no, I don't want to do this. So anyway, he said, okay, and they arranged to meet with him, and what it comes down to is that the magician Houdini conveyed this coded message through Ford, through this, this uh, spirit Fletcher. They wrote it down, makes no sense to anybody. Houdini's wife reads it and goes, that's my husband. That's it, that's the message. I now know that my husband is alive in spirit world. Ford became famous for that, you know. Uh, and he went on to do, you know, many other famous sittings. And Ford became part of a whole society. There was a whole society of people who were studying spiritual phenomena. Uh, and some of them were like him. Some of them were spiritual persons or mediums. Uh, most of them were not. 
Some of them were scientists. Some of them were scholars. One of them everybody knows, I think. You ever hear of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Or Sherlock Holmes? He's the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes. This man was very, very much a believer, very interested in life after death. He was a part of that society. And they did crazy experiments to prove that there is life after death. One of them was, one of the people in the society was, he was getting older, so they arranged with him, okay, here's the message you have to convey from the other side. But we want you to convey this message in pieces through different mediums around the country. Mediums who don't even know about this society. He died, and over the course of, some, I think it was something like three years, they get people calling saying, yeah, you know, um, uh, I got this message from this guy, and he said to say this, you know, it doesn't even make sense by itself, it's just a piece of another complete message. And over the course of three years, through like 50 different mediums all around the world, around the country, they collected the entire message. How else, how else could this be? There's no way, you know, no way for this to happen unless this person really was there in spirit world conveying this. So they did many, many things scientifically proving this. Um, and if you ever happen to run across a, a book by Arthur Ford, an old copy, you'll find an entire chapter about his sittings with Reverend Sum Young Moon. Ford was doing a sitting with some Christian ministers and one of the people who was, one of the spirits who came to talk to them was a friend of theirs. This man was a missionary in Korea, the guy in spirit world. And this man was saying, this missionary was saying, you know, when I got to spirit world I found that everything was just as I was told it would be. And they said, who told you? Well, when I was a missionary in Korea, I met this young minister by the name of Sam Young Moon. He explained to me everything about spirit world, and it turned out he was right. And they all went, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy who knew about spirit world that well? Because even we don't. You know, even we, you know, mediums and everything, we still don't know what it's like. Um, so they're really desperate to meet Father, and it so happened that maybe a, a year or so or less after that, Father was on a world tour and Father came to America. It was something like 1965 or something like that. And so they, they said, you know, we'd like to meet with you. And they did a sitting with Father. And there was Father, Wanpak Che, uh, I think Lady Dr. Kim, of course Bohi Pak was there at the time translating. Uh, and you know, they did this sitting. And, and these Christian ministers, unfortunately for them. <coughs> Because this is just a, f a few things that the, the spirit said, this guy Fletcher, the MC spirit said. Um, he said, you know, um, let me explain to you. You guys often ask me things about, you know, very high things, as if I should know many things just because I've lived in spirit world so long. Therefore, you think my spirit is very high. That's a mistake, okay? It doesn't matter how long I've lived in spirit world. I've been here 50 years. doesn't mean a damn thing. Honestly, in this case, right now, you're wasting your time asking me anything because you're sitting in the presence of people whose spirit is so high and so bright that if you could see them, you, if your spiritual eyes would open, you would be blind. So I don't know why you're asking me anything. You should be talking to these people. And they were already, <laughs> the ministers are already kind of confused. Uh, nobody ever, you know, this guy never said like this about anybody before. Um, and the problem is the, these ministers, they, they had heard already some rumors about Father and, you know, and they were kind of skeptical and they asked the wrong questions. Um, they asked Fletcher, okay, well, uh, whose who's teaching is really true? Jesus' teaching or Reverend Moon's teaching? Oops, they really should not have asked that question. So they, this spirit said, well, um, actually, there is no difference there is no difference between what Jesus was teaching and what Reverend Moon was teaching. But 
There is a very big difference between what Jesus taught and what you people think Jesus taught. In fact, you guys are so far away from Jesus' teaching, you wouldn't recognize it if it punched you in the nose. And he started scolding these Christian ministers. And said, if you really want to know something about Jesus' teaching, you should listen to Reverend Moon. And they were, oh my God. And he kept going. He said, you people are, you people are thinking about, you know, Jesus... Jesus, you know, Jesus Christ. Christ is the Spirit of God. Okay? Jesus is dead. Jesus is not coming back. Okay? Christ is. Christ is the Spirit of God coming through man. Well, that happens to be right now Reverend Moon. The Spirit of Truth that is speaking through man today, the highest truth that is being spoken through man today is through Reverend Moon. You should be talking to him. It's all kinds of things like this. And this was in Ford's book. Um, and after Ford had that sitting, Ford would come and visit uh, the members and come and visit the church very often. Uh, there's even old, there's old uh, uh, recording of Father had a meeting with members in Washington, D.C., probably in 1970 or 69 or something like that. And Ford was there and Father saw him and For Father said, invited him up on the stage, you know, you know, come up here, do your thing, you know. He's like, no, I just came here to listen to you. He said, no, 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 you know, come here, because these people don't understand anything about the spirit world. I want you to help educate them. So he said, okay. <laughs> and he did the same, same kind of thing. Uh, Ford, unfortunately, then died in 1970. Uh, he, was, he was already 70-something uh, years old by that time. Uh, but then after Ford died, uh, why I said if you find this book and find an old copy is after Ford died, the publishers started getting a lot of complaints from people about this book that you have that is saying basically like 80% 80, 80 you're saying that Reverend Moon is the Messiah. We kind of don't like that. So they're getting these kind of negative letters. So the publisher took all the books off the shelves and reprinted it without that chapter. Uh, unknown but known, something like that. <laughs> Because I happened to find, find a copy. See, you know, they, told, they take them off the shelves. If libraries have books, they tell the libraries to throw them out. Can a library throw out a book? No, they sell them. So I found in the center one time, this book, it had a stamp on it, you know, from the library, and a stamp on top of that said, discard, means throw away. And it had that whole chapter. It was not the end of the chapter is printed a little bit strange. Somebody did something to it. It's not the end. End is a little bit odd, uh, but there's a, actually a paperback version that they made, also before he died, that has the proper proper ending. But so these things exist. Okay, Ford also, after he died, would write another book. His testimony from spiritual world. Now some of you guys may have heard about uh, Dr. Sang Hung Lee. Dr. Sang Hun Lee is not the only person who made testimonies from spiritual world. There are many, actually. Arthur Ford was one of them. There's another one that uh, it's in our movement. A lot of people know this book called "Wander in the Spirit." Wander in the Spirit Lands. This is a testimony from an Italian artist, who, by the way, did not start spirit world in a very good place. Um, there's another other books, life. I don't want to say, ah, Life in the World Unseen by a guy by the name of Ant I think Anthony Borgia. He was a, uh, he was a British minister, Anglican minister uh, from the early 20th century, I think. His testimony is from Spirit World. And if you can ever find these books, read them. Please read them. Because the majority of what is written there is very true. If you find books about people who have near-death experience, do you know what near-death experience is? You got hit by a car, you died for four minutes, you went to spirit world for four minutes, and then you write a 200-page book about it. These books, please avoid. What in God's name can a man write about life in spirit world if he was only there for four minutes? He still didn't figure out where the hell he was yet. He didn't really know happened to him, you know. My mother gave me one of these books one time and I just about, you know, threw up reading it. 
imagine this, the woman. The woman had this experience 19 years before she wrote the book. Dead for four minutes, 19 years later she's writing a book. Hmm, I wonder how much of this she made up. So ignore those books, but the books, there are actual books of testimonies from the spiritual world. And of course, if you've ever seen the movie, What Dreams May Come, you've seen, actually you've seen the, you've seen the, only, the only movie that shows spirit world, strangely enough. Um, and that movie was about 80% correct. Do you know why? Because it was based on a book. The book was written by a guy who studied all about spirit world. In the back of the book, there's a bibliography of the like 80 or 90 books that he used as reference. And that story was all, he wrote it for one purpose, to teach people about what life is like in spirit world. So he pieced together all these kind of things. He read Ford's book. He read this, these other testimonies from spirit world. Unfortunately, he read the life, you know, the near-death experience books too, which confused him. Um, but uh, it was very accurate because he really studied, and he, his purpose was to show about life in spirit world. So there's a lot of things. And of course, it's just, you know, it's understandable, and it's important. It's important to understand about spirit world. We think in terms of it's a world of cause and this is the world of result. What's more important? Cause. Why something happened is more important than what happened. Uh, so there's a, a lot we need to, a lot we can gain if we have an understanding of that. So, based on what we've already talked about, for us, in order for us to grow to perfection, in order for us to fulfill God's dream and fulfill our purpose. All of it has to do with spiritual growth. We're not talking about growing our body. We're talking about growing our spirit. So we have to understand the principles of spiritual growth. What does man need to develop his spirit? So in the physical world, we have our physical self. Spirit world, our spirit self. We have a mind and body of both. Physical mind f focuses on the uh, desires for food, sleep, and sex is basically the same as animal's instinct, because dealing only with physical things, physical survival, and sex, sex is not about sex. Sex is about survival of lineage for animals, you know. They're thinking about survival of species. Therefore, they have this instinct to multiply. You know, that's what it's about, and essentially all about survival. So our physical mind is like that, deals only with these physical things, that's it. And our physical body is just an expression of the mind. Spirit mind is completely different. Spirit mind pursues internal values. Love, beauty, truth, goodness. These are the desires of our spiritual mind. If you ever want to talk about what's the difference between man and animals, that's it. It's right there. As much as people, you know, if you, if you tell people, you know, okay, dogs don't have spirit. Don't say that. Because <laughs> when I die, I want to bring my dog with me. You know? <laughs> well, honestly, if you, you know, to tell you the truth, if you go to Good Spirit World, you can make a dog there. <laughs> By your will, you can make whatever kind of dog you like. You can make one that doesn't poop on the carpet, you know? <laughs> as you wish, if you're in Good Spirit World. But the, the main thing about that is not whether they have a spirit or not. The main thing is, for us, what does spirit mean? Well, in terms of this, you know, our spiritual mind, we have desires for truth and love and beauty and goodness. Animals do not. If you've ever had, anyone ever have a dog? Anyone ever notice the things that your dog may eat? Dogs, obviously, don't have a sense of beauty. You know, I had a dog, you know, he was chewing on a bone and it was covered in dirt and I thought I would help him out and I washed it off. Gave it back to him, nice clean bone. He took it, looked at me like I'm an idiot. Went over, dug a hole and buried it in the dirt. So that the next day he could dig it up, covered in mud and happily start eating it again, so. So I just looked at him and just go, you are a non-spiritual being. That's clear. Okay. So 
So how we, how we understand are about spiritual growth. Well, actually, on the bottom you can see how things grow and develop in the physical world, because this is the world. Of, this physical world is a world of effect, the world of result. Uh, how things grow in the physical world is a reflection of how they grow in spirit world. So we look at how things grow in the physical world. Everything needs certain elements. Elements are nutrients. We have positive ones like light and air. What we mean by positive in the sense that positive is subjective. It means you are objects, it is subject, and it just kind of comes to you. You know, you don't have to go looking for air, do you? Usually, unless you're in a place where people smoke. Um, air is there. You just receive it. Sunlight is there. You just receive it. So that's what we mean, positive. You know, it's subject and you just in position to receive it. Then there are negative elements or nutrients that you need, like food and water. These are negative because they're objective. You, as subject, have to go and get them. You know, by your effort, you have to, you know, go and find food or make food or, you know, at least take it out of the freezer and put it in the microwave, one or the other. Uh, by your own efforts. It's positive and negative. And having both these things to their give and take inside your physical body, you're able to grow. Physically, you grow. So that means in spirit world, there also must be certain kind of elements. And there also must be positive and negative elements. As a ref you know, physical life is a reflection of spiritual life. So those elements that we need for our spiritual self to grow, positive element we call a life element. Negative element we call vitality element. So let me explain. Okay. Life element refers to God's love and truth. Okay. Do you have to go and get this? You have to go out to God, love me! No, and it wouldn't work if you did. Um, love is something that's given and you receive it. And truth is something that's given and you receive it. You don't make it yourself. Now, what we have to understand about this, now normally this is, the, you know, you're not going to hear this explanation too much, but if you understand this, you'll understand you'll understand the fall of man a lot better and you'll understand the need for true parents a whole lot better okay this life element that you receive God's love and truth what kind of love are we talking about think in terms of we're talking about you need to grow that means you're immature say like a child what child for a child to grow what kind of love do they need Parental love. We're not talking about any other kind of love here. Any other kind of love has nothing to do with this. That which it gives life element is parental love. Okay? Where do you get that from? I've already written there, so I've, you know, I've given away the secret. But it's very important because a lot of people, they don't, they don't get this. You know, because the principle said, it's God's love and truth, so it's God's love, so I get it from God. Really? You have that direct relationship with God? You receive parental love from God Himself? If you did, you wouldn't be a fallen man. You wouldn't have the problems that you do. It's a, you have to think about it more. People didn't think enough. Fundamentally, all love, you know, good love and truth comes from God, fundamentally. But you don't receive it directly. Where do you get your parental love from is your parents. That's just normal. It was supposed to start from Adam and Eve as the first two parents and then pass down, pass down, pass down, pass down, you know. Each, each generation of parents becoming true parents, inheriting the standard of true parents as it should have been with all of our parents, our physical parents. Knowing this and then understanding that the fall of man, understanding that th th that did not happen, this becomes an important thing. That life element that we need to receive to grow to perfection is a very important thing. What I've written here is this, the standard, means the standard of that love that you're given. The standard that you receive will determine the potential standard that man can reach. If you have been given 100% true love, 
if you have received 100% true parental love, then potentially, depending on what you do, you can reach perfection because you received perfect parental love. If you haven't received 100%, of course, these numbers, you know, kind of—it's kind of strange to relate to, but you know, it's easy. Say you didn't receive 100% parental love; you received 50%. Your parents did the best they could, but their hearts weren't that big. They could only give you 50% parental love. What's your potential? Through all the effort you might make, you're going to grow up and your heart is going to be how big? How much love are you going to have? 50%. Did you ever hear this kind of phenomena of where you grow up and you find out you became just like your parents? Now, in some cases, that's not a bad thing. In some cases, it is. Some cases, you really, really did not want to become like your father and mother. In fact, you made special effort throughout your whole life to do everything to not become like my father. <laughs> Goal of my life was to not be like my father. You know, I, knew, I, honestly, I knew a kid like this. His father was a raging alcoholic. His father was a deeply insecure man, not educated, and put those together made him more insecure. And then he, because of that insecurity, he drank, and he ridiculed, you know, ridiculed, criticized, and beat his son on a you know daily basis. So obviously, son did not want to be like dad. And the son was smart, and the son went to university and the son got a very good job, and the son is a raging alcoholic, just like his dad. I don't know how he treats his children. I didn't get that far. How can it be? Because the parental love that was given to him was limited, and he inherited that same standard of love. And no matter what he did, that decided his potential of growth, that life element, the standard you receive, will determine your, your potential, big or small. It's a very important point to understand. If you receive this love from God directly, none of us would have a problem. But the parental love we receive comes from fallen parents, because they got, came from fallen parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. Nobody's fault, it's just reality. So therefore the parental love that we receive is limited. And that already puts you at a disadvantage. So it's something very important to understand. Now that life element is just part of it. You know, love and truth is just part of it. You can receive it. Do you now grow because you received it? Right. You're loving somebody, and as long as you love them, they're going to automatically grow like a watering a flower? Um, no. We already talked about that. There's something you need to do. That's where the vitality element comes into, comes into play. Vitality element is made by practicing God's word, which means practicing love and truth. The love and truth that you received, you have to practice, okay? You were taught truth, you were taught what's good, now you have to live that way. You were given love. By the way, how do you practice love? Who, who, can, who can tell me? How do you practice love? Come on. And, and doing what with him? Yeah. The way you practice love is you were given love, now you have to give that love to others. As you are given love, you give love to others. And that's what we already talked about. That's fulfilling our, our responsibility. By fulfilling our responsibility, we make that vitality element. And that allows us to grow. In terms of living according to truth or doing what's good, simply live for the sake of the greater good. That's most, fun, most basic fundamental truism most basic fundamental standard of goodness is living for the sake of something greater than yourself. Living for the greater good. And you do this during your physical life. And that vitality element is then created during your physical life. And this life element, vitality element, together is what allows you to grow. 
Now another, another example, you want to take a physical example of this, of life element, vitality element. For your physical body, you want, your, you want to say develop, you know, develop your muscles. If you want your muscles to develop, is it enough just to exercise? You know, exercise a lot. You exercise a lot, but you don't need a lot. What's going to happen? Brothers, anyone know, that, know about this? You work out a lot, you exercise a lot, do a lot of physical activity, you don't need enough. What's going to happen? You get skinny. <laughs> you know? Your muscles will develop to a point, then your muscles start to burn. <laughs> because you're not feeding your body, and your body doesn't have anything else to burn. First thing that's going to burn is your muscles. Oops. So, in order for you to develop muscles, you have to feed yourself. You have to eat certain things in a certain amount. If you want your muscles to develop a certain amount, you have to eat a certain amount. If you don't eat enough, your muscles are not going to develop. That's in a, in a simplistic manner. That's life element and vitality element. You receive so much life element, if you practice it 100%, then you'll grow according to that amount. If you don't receive much life element, no matter what you do, you can't grow. No matter what effort you make, you're not going to grow much. If the standard of love that you received is not so great, the standard of truth was not so high, you can't grow so much. You know, the highest standard of truth you know is don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Your spirit is not going to grow very high. <laughs> You're still going to be like, you know, the spiritual standard of a you know, five-year-old. Uh, all right, maybe ten. Okay. So these two things become important. Okay. The standard of parental love you receive and also the standard of truth because these things will determine how we grow. But then it's still determined in the end on our effort, the vitality element. And the last thing is as you create this vitality element, your spirit gives something back to your body. This is what we call the living spirit element. So as your spirit grows, creates this living spirit element, comes back to your physical self, and it gives you a sense sometimes of health, uh, strength, energy. You should be tired, but you're not. <laughs> you ever, ever notice that you're doing something, really focused on doing something, and you didn't eat much? You should be tired, but you're not. A lot of times it's because what you're doing, and it may not be you're doing something that's, you know, you know very high spiritually. You're doing something for the sake of, you know, something a little bit more than yourself. Even that's enough to create vitality element and that spirit element and that spirit element what keeps you awake. You know, I, had, I had these experiences when I was in university. Uh, I was studying uh, literature and theater and I had all this, I was doing all this kind of work in the theater and I was completely, I was a workaholic. So I did everything. My job was this, I did ten times that. You know, just to make sure everything's okay, you know. Just in case somebody else doesn't do their job, so I, you know, did everything. I lived, I even, I actually a couple times, I slept on the stage. You know, we finished rehearsals and I said, nah, I'm not even going to go home. And I slept on the stage, rolled off the stage and went to class the next day. Um, and normally when we had these kind of theatrical productions is at the end of semester. End of semester, especially spring, means when seasons are changing. What happens when seasons are changing? Y'all get sick, right? <laughs> It goes from warm to cold, but then it's a little bit cold again, and then warm again, and then that's when everybody gets sick. Um, and that's also when you have exams, you have this exam, that exam, you have all these projects, and I was doing this whole theater, and I didn't have time to be sick. <laughs> and I didn't have time to feed myself either. You won't, I won't bother to tell you how I ate then, you know. Uh, and I remember one day feeling a little bit, you know, sore throat. And my thought was, well, I, I don't have time to be sick, so I ignored it. And it went away. And I was fine. I was perfectly fine. Perfectly fine, healthy, not a sniffle, not a sore throat, not a cough, until the show ended. We did our last performance. Everything finished. And in the two hours it took from when the curtain went down to taking the stuff off the stage, I was completely dead sick. I had such a high fever, I lost consciousness. I had to be carried back to my room. 
the next day, you know, I'm lying in bed. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just going to stay here and make sure I'm okay. I'm lying in bed. My body starts to feel funny. My, my tongue felt like a loaf of bread. You know that kind of feeling? Like your tongue is like a loaf of bread. It's like a big thing in your mouth, you know. <laughs> my shoes felt like, my feet felt like they were boxes. It was very weird, you know. And it wasn't because I had any drugs. And I had my friend take my temperature, and it was something like, well, I don't, in, in Celsius, I don't know what it would be. In Fahrenheit, it was 103. Normal is 98.6. It was 103. It means my brain was being cooked. <laughs> and he said, oh, that's why I feel like this. And it lasted a couple of days. Now, how is it, how is it possible? that I, be, I can be completely healthy and within two hours become that sick. It's not possible, actually. My body actually was sick. But that spirit element just kept me feeling okay. As long as I was busy doing something, I was doing something, for, you know, even that much, just you know, a theater show, but it, I was doing it so that it would be good for everybody, everyone would be happy, you know. Even just that much. But when the show was over, <laughs> It wasn't good, what I was doing wasn't good enough to heal me. It was just good enough to let me feel good. Um, when the show was over, boom, done. No more spirit element and, pfft, you know. <laughs> and can you, can you believe something that, re that extreme happened to me two years in a row? Exact same thing. Well, except the second year I got as far as the door of the place where we were supposed to have the party after the show, and then I collapsed on the step. So I got a little bit farther before I collapsed that time. So spirit element is a real thing. Now, here we're talking about in terms of growing. In terms of growing, we're talking about obviously good vitality elements. Doing good things, good vitality elements. But actually, vitality elements aren't good all by themselves. If you do good, you make good vitality elements. If you do evil, you make evil vitality elements. So let's talk about this a little bit, the effects of good and evil vitality elements. So kind of simple, but it's something you, sh you should keep in mind. So if man does good, means he's living according to his divine nature, he's loving others, he's living for a greater good, creates good vitality elements that go to his spirit self. His spirit, you say, can become bright, becomes healthy. By the way, you, you, the image, if anyone is concerned about the image of your spirit, what does your spirit look like? Anyone ever have this question, what does your spirit look like? You know, it looks like you. <laughs> it does not look like this glowing ball. It does not look like some kind of mist, okay? It looks like you. Now, to add to that, um, if your spirit is good, you will look young. So for those of you who are afraid of becoming old and ugly, and then dying, and then going to eternal spiritual world as an old person, you're going, I don't want to do I don't want to live forever looking like this. Don't worry about it, okay? If your spirit is good, you look young. Anyone see the movie Field of Dreams? Yeah. Kevin Costner? No? Yes? His, anyway, his father, he sees his father, he's got, you know, spirits of baseball players come and play in his cornfield, you know. His spirit of his father comes and he sees his father as a young man, as he was when he was young. Um, that's not the reason I'm saying this, okay, I'm just giving an example. Uh, and if your spirit is good, it will be bright. So, when people say they saw angels, most outside people, they say, had an experience of angels. If you go to a bookstore, there's entire sections on angels. My experiences with angels. 99.99% of the time, these people never saw an angel. <laughs> it was not an angel. They asked Damon him about it. The angel, until Damon him convinced the angels to come and work with men, the angels didn't want to have a damn thing to do with us. It took a lot of effort for Damon to convince him to do anything with us, and they do things there in Chumpung, and you bet your money they're not even stepping outside the place. Um, for the most part, what they saw was a good spirit, actually. And actually, you know, sometimes people get to, you know, go back and forth. 
you know, this person died and then eventually he became an angel. You know, they're confusing things. Angels are different beings altogether. But when they see some bright spirit, it's actually a good spirit person. But if your spirit is evil, it is ugly. Oh, ugly. And smells. Dark, ugly, and smells. Okay. So where people talk about you know demons or devils or whatever, these don't exist at all. Angels actually do exist. Demons and devils, they don't exist at all. They're people. Evil people. Nasty, evil-looking monsters, those are people. <laughs> Ew. Uh, but that's their spiritual reality. Just for your information. So as you receive these good vitality elements from the good things you do, your spirit grows, and your spirit, say, grows closer to God's heart. Your heart, your heart grows, right? Your heart becomes more like God. It makes you more able to receive love. You're able to receive more love from God. Remember I talked about the ocean of love in God's heart and your coffee cup? Okay. So through creating good vitality elements, your coffee cup gets bigger. Your heart grows. And what happens is, it's not that God now loves you more. It's now that you become more sensitive to God's love. Remember how I talked about when you were a kid and your parents told you don't do this and don't do that and they'll let you do that and you were sure that your parents are evil dictators <laughs> that say they love me. You know, because I love you. That's why I won't let you go and play outside in the, you know, in the street. I don't understand that, you know. <laughs> because I love you. As a kid, you're not, you're not perceptive to this. You're not sensitive that your parents are loving you. As you get older and mature, hopefully, you come to recognize that actually, yeah, this was love. And you don't have resentments that they made you do this or didn't let you do that. Because as you grow up, you realize they're loving me. They might annoy me to death. Um, where are you? What are you doing? Why don't you call home? Yes, they'll annoy you, but at least you know why now. <laughs> It's not because they want to drive you crazy. It's because they love you. So if, you, if you've matured in heart, you become more sensitive to that love. But that love was always there. It was always there. Just your immature heart was not sensitive to it. So for this person, as you grow, you become more sensitive to God's love. You know, it used to be, it took, it took some very big event for, you know, some big thing for something to be done or said to you that you could really say, you know, I felt love. And then it comes to a point where you're walking down the street and this bird comes by j with uh, an interesting song and you just go, that's so cool. And you feel God's love from that. You know, you become more sensitive. This person then, feeling in a position to receive more love, feels more love, that puts him in a position to give more love. And he can go right around and love people more. Do more good things. And this can become a very nice spiraling motion. You do good things, your heart grows, you feel closer to God, you feel more love and you go and you give more love and this just develops and expands and you grow like that. Very nice upwardly moving circle. If you do evil, it's quite the opposite. You do evil means you do things out of your fallen nature, right? Selfish thoughts, selfish actions, you do things out of jealousy, resentment, whatever. Okay? Fundamentally selfish things. That creates evil vitality elements affects your spirit. Your spirit starts to become dark. Your spirit starts to become sick. And what happens? Your spirit falls farther from God's heart, becomes less able to receive love. Falling away from God is in the sense of, you know, better you can explain, your heart becomes smaller. Your heart sh shrinks. You do enough of this, you're, even your, your small coffee cup sized heart you do enough of this stuff, your heart is going to become the size of an old, dried raisin. 
hard and small. Good luck getting any love in that thing. You couldn't even force it in there if you tried. Heart gets smaller, actually. In that, in that sense, you're falling farther from God's heart because your heart becoming less like His. And guess what? You're less able to receive love, so how do you feel? It makes you less able to give love, and you feel this term that we should know from the principle, lack of love. Anyone ever heard of lack of love? Feeling less love? By your own selfish actions, you have put yourself in that position to feel less love, to feel lack of love. Problem is, for fallen man, that feeling of lack of love usually leads to what? Fallen nature. It leads to selfish actions. For fallen man, sadly, it's almost automatic. It shouldn't be, but that's how we are. You feel lack of love, you feel less love, and nobody loves me, and you, know, and you become more selfish. Now what happens to this person? This is, this, the worst example of this, I call these black hole people. You know what a black hole is? Can you fill a black hole? No. There are people like this, desperately trying to get love. Nobody loves me, I need to get love. Somebody should love me. And they just, but that whole idea, you know, somebody should love me. Selfish. Boom, it's selfish. Trying to get love, there's no such thing principally about getting love. Love is about giving. You can receive it if someone else gives it to you, but you can't go and get it. So these people become selfish, trying to get somebody to love them, pay attention to them, do things for me, whatever, you know, and they, by doing that, they create more evil vitality elements, and their heart gets smaller. What happens to these people is, you know, like this. You could pour all your love out to them, and then you have the whole of mankind loving them. And they won't feel it. They won't notice it. You go, nobody loves me. And you're going, I got all mankind here loving you. What the hell are you talking about? Nobody loves you. They don't really love me. Oh my God. To me, it's, to me, it's a big red flag whenever I hear somebody say, you know, I don't feel any love in this place. I don't feel any love in this team. I don't feel any love in this center. 99.99% of the time, who's got the love problem here? Everyone else in the center, everyone else on the team is not loving you? Or actually you are not loving anybody else? That's usually, that's usually, what the, the, that's usually the case. That's usually the problem. And the sad thing is about those people. You could try to give them, you try to help them, you try to love them. From your side, I'll say, from your side, you're not wasting your time. From your side, okay? Any effort to love, you know, love others is to your benefit. But you should just know that if the person is like this, this kind of black hole, don't be surprised when they start complaining that you're not loving them. Two seconds after you just did. Um, because they've put themselves into this selfish cycle. Okay. So it's very important, you know, to to always be giving, to always be giving love, no matter what you have. The little phrase that I wrote at the bottom, is, these two are unrelated, by the way, Luke nineteen twenty six and that phrase. That phrase is a I think it's an Indian proverb. All that is not given is lost. So if you're talking in terms of love, it's very true. Any amount of love that you have received, anything, if you do not multiply it, give it, you'll lose it. You will not, your heart will not grow. In fact, it'll become smaller. The quote of Luke 19.26, I, I won't give you the whole parable, but it's a simple parable where uh, Jesus talks about a guy, landowner, who gave, was going on a trip and gave money to his three servants to take care of, 
you know, gave one like, you know, 5,000 bucks, I'm gonna give a thousand, last one he gave like 50. And uh, he came, when he came back, the first two servants had taken that money and invested it and multiplied it and doubled that money. And he was so happy with them, not only did he let them keep the money, but he gave them a part of his land. The third servant, even he only had 50 bucks, was afraid to lose it and buried it in the ground. And the guy, the landowner, took the money away from him, gave it to the first guy, took that third guy and threw him out. And what Jesus says, and Jesus says, you know, those who, you know, for those who uh, have more, more will be given, and those who have little, even the little they have, they will lose. Now, it confused everybody because he was talking about money. So what the hell is he saying? The rich get richer, the poor get poorer? That's not right. But he was talking about love. Whatever you have been given, love or good things you have been given, if you multiply it, giving it to others, more will be given to you by God. But even if you have a small amount, even if you have a small amount, it's fine, but if you don't multiply it, you're going to lose even that. Okay. So we come down to the purpose and value of man's physical life, which already you start to understand. What's the most important thing for man to do in his life? Simplest example. Take the relationship of man's physical self and spirit self like the relationship between a vine and a fruit. Right? The fruit receives all the necessary elements it needs to develop, to become mature, to become ripe. Everything that it needs, it receives through the vine. Man's spirit self is the same. Everything you need to receive to grow your spirit, you receive during your physical life. Now even you receive life element, life element is a spiritual thing, but that life element has no value if you haven't made vitality element in your physical life. And then what happens, you know, when the fruit reaches maturity, any, any of you ever gone to a vineyard? Or you live in a country where these things grow all over the place? I've been to a few places like that. If you see a, if you see a grape vine, what's the first thing you look for? Grape. Are there any grapes on it? <laughs> you don't go, wow, that's a very big vine. There's very beautiful leaves. You're going, any grapes on the damn thing? Are they ripe yet? And if you find those ripe grapes, are you going to sit there and look at them? They look very pretty up there. It's very nice. Very, it's kind of artistic the way they're hanging. No, you go, whoa, and you take them and you eat them. Because the purpose of that fruit is not to stay on the vine. Once that fruit is ripe, it has a purpose somewhere else entirely. You know, and eventually in your stomach, when, in whatever form. You know, whether it was jam, vi you know, wine, or whatever. Uh, its purpose is somewhere else. Its purpose is not to stay on the vine. You know, when the vine dries up and dies, it's fine. Its purpose is fulfilled. So the same thing for our spirit self. Our spirit self remains with our physical body in order to grow and reach perfection. And if we've grown to maturity and then our physical body dies, that's fine. That's how it should be. You know, physical body goes back to the earth. That's great. Because its job was fulfilled. I have now a uh, perfected spirit, mature spirit. That then goes to live for eternity in spirit world. One of the big problems is, same here, if you have a vine, the fruit is not ripe, and the vine gets cut, the fruit continues to ripen? No, the fruit will stop growing. That's it. The vine is cut, the source of those nutrients is gone, it cannot grow anymore. The same with our spirit self. Our spirit self cannot grow to perfection if our physical life ends too soon. It's, that's it. Cut off. That's one of the reasons why something like suicide is such a huge, huge, huge mistake. Because no matter what your situation is, as long as you are alive, you can fix anything. Your spirit can grow, and in terms of if you've made any mistakes and damaged your spirit, as long as you are alive, you can fix any damage to your spirit self as long as you're alive. Suicide is, suicide is one of Satan's favorite, favorite temptations. 
you screw up, he helps you screw up, and then before you have a chance to fix it, you die. He loves it. He's helped you screw up, and then he persuades you, better if you were dead, and then you can't even fix the things you screwed up. Big, big mistake. So what it comes down to is, these are two purposes. For your physical life, grow and perfect your spirit self, number one. Which means develop to perfection the ability to give and receive God's true love. Develop a heart like God's. Fulfill the four realms of heart and learn to love as God loves. That's what it's all about. Developing your spirit means developing, most of all, your ability to love. Developing your heart, fulfilling those four realms of heart. That's what it's about. Anyone ever see this movie Flatliners? It's a very famous, famous old movie. It's got so many cool things. It was such a cool movie. And there's one very simple moment. Uh, girls working at, as a nurse in a section with a lot of old ladies. And one old lady says, you know, I've been hearing voices and angels telling me that it's okay for me to die. It's okay for me to go. And the, why? The angel said, because you've already told everyone that you love them. Now, of course, that's very simplistic, you know. Going around and telling everyone, I love you, I love you, I love everybody. That really doesn't qualify for this, okay? But in the sense of, you know, as, you know, a uh, uh, symbolic example, that's what it comes down to. You fulfill your responsibility in terms, of, in terms of heart, in terms of love. Then you're ready to go. And what's the second one? I love this, I, you know, I just love the way it's written in the principle because you don't know how long it took many people to understand what the hell this meant. Multiply other spirit selves. Multiplication of spirit selves. We used to write it down, we put it on the board, multiplication of spirit selves, and we left it alone because we didn't know what the hell this was talking about. I wrote it for you. Have kids! There's your two purposes of your spiritual life. Perfect your spirit self and make more. Perfect yourself as a child of God and make more children of God. That's your purpose. Those two things. Now I'll tell you what Father said about having children. Father is so serious about this. How important this is. How valuable this is. The Father said, even if you were so poor, if you were so poor that all your children would die of starvation within a few months, better you have 20 children than two who would live forever. I mean, who would live a full life. Better to have... 20 children that would die of starvation within a few months than to have two children that could live to old age. Now, of course, that's extreme. Father doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, if you don't have enough food, just keep having babies. Father's trying to make a point, dramatic point. He said, that is the value. That is the incredible and immeasurable value of a spiritual life. Because you're talking about an eternal life. Okay, they only live for two months on earth. They live forever as God's children in the spirit world. Forever. You've created an eternal spiritual life. So, from God's viewpoint, there's one family that made two. There's another family that made 20. Who does God appreciate more? Father even said, you know, in, in the heavenly kingdom, there's going to be competition between families. Who's better? And it's going to be based on how many kids you had. No shit. See, Hyunjin, Hyunjin is really, Hyunjin is really, you know, following Father's standard in that. You know. I think he's ahead of everybody at this point. Um, but that's, it's hard, it's hard, because you're living in this world all the time, right? You've never been to spirit world, it's hard to get. So let me explain a little bit more. Give you another perspective. It's also something Father had, has said. You know, man's, man's life in the physical world, you can compare to his life in the womb. So in fact, we say there's like three stages of our life. 
formation, growth, and completion, but in this sense of your whole life. Formation is in the mother's womb. Growth stage is this physical world. And completion is living in the spirit world. Those three stages. So you live for nine, you know, nine months in the womb. Actually, everyone says nine months, right? Did you ever read your birth certificate? Do you know what it's going to say on your birth certificate? If you, if you were, you know, if you were, weren't born very early or very late, it's not going to say nine months. Anyone know what it says? Actually, the actual, you know, ask a doctor the actual medical time, time period, what it should be. 40 weeks. Actually, it's supposed, to be, it's supposed to be considered 40 weeks, technically. Weird, huh? 40. Hmm. Interesting. So then, nine months in the womb, 90 years plus or minus a few in the physical world, and eternity in the spirit world. That's how long you live, right? I hate the word eternity. You know, it's too short to express what it's talking about. You know, they, they should make a word that has at least, you know, 20 letters in it. You know, eternity, you know, something, anyway, you know. Give you a sense that it's longer, okay? So he backs in the mother's, in the mother's womb. Mother's womb is an environment of water, right? You're in this bubble of water, swimming around. And what are you doing? What? What should the baby be doing in the womb? Should be preparing for the next stage of life. Developing hands and feet and fingers, eyes, nose, ears, mouth, all these things that it does not use in the womb. Do you ever think about that? It doesn't need any of these things in the womb. At all. It's got a mouth, it has nothing to say. No. Nose, nothing to smell. No. Eyes, you really wouldn't want to see what it looks like in there, so they're closed. And developing lungs, but it doesn't breathe in the womb. Everything, all the nutrients it needs, it receives directly through the umbilical cord. So what an idiotic waste of time. What the hell is the baby doing in there, you know? It doesn't need any of those things there. Because its entire purpose is to prepare for the next stage of life. That's it. That's it. The only thing of importance that the baby does in the womb is that which will prepare it for life in this physical world. And one of those things is being able to breathe air. That's vital. Because you go to this physical world, we're living in an environment of air. Air is a very fundamental element of life in this physical world. If you can't breathe, you're done. You can't live. And if you have a problem with breathing, that means you're going to have a hard time in this physical world. You're going to suffer. It's going to be hard for you. You have asthma or some kind of limitation with your lungs. It's going to make life difficult. So it's very important you develop those things. And by the way, what happens, like for example, if a kid, you know, baby in the womb, one of its arms does not develop completely. After it's born, it, the arm will grow, right? No. It's called a birth defect. Once it's born into this world, those things will not correct themselves. That's it. Done. I had a cousin who had some, some problem with his heart. His heart was too small. He had to have operation after operation like his entire very short life. He, he, he lived to the maximum, which was 40 years. He had to have like seven operations during the course of his life to constantly correct that birth defect of his heart. Because once you're born that way, if those things were not done in the womb, you can't do them afterwards. That's it. You know this, right? Life in this physical world is exactly the same as that. Life in this physical world, no matter what other things there are, the only thing that matters is how much you've prepared for the next stage of life. 
Everything else is what you call, it's just decoration. <laughs> Everything beyond this purpose of developing our relationship with God, developing our heart, fulfilling through blessings, all the rest is just bullshit. It doesn't matter. Because this is going to decide your eternal life. We have a hard time. It's still hard for us to imagine, you know, because we haven't been there. And we've only lived in this physical world. It's hard for us to even imagine the idea of living somewhere forever. But anyone, did anyone ever, you know, when you were a kid, you were born in one place and you lived there for like a, a year or less and then you moved to another place where you lived the rest of your life? Anyone have this kind of situation? You were born in one town and your parents lived there like, you know, a very short time and then you went somewhere else and lived there? You have that? Where, where, where were you born originally? Okay, so you were in Ukraine for how long? Uh, six years. Ah, uh, six years is too long. Too long. Too long. No, I, knew one, I knew one girl, she was born, born in Tajikistan. I'm not going to try to explain where that is anyway. It's somewhere in the you know, middle of Russia. Um, Born in Tajikistan, lived there for like, I don't know, half a year, maybe a year. And then she moved to this other place in Russia, Rostov, and lived there for the rest of her life. Well, uh, at least she lived there for the next, you know, 20 years or so. So one place she lived for a few months, the other place she lived for about 20 years. If you asked her where she is from, is she going to say Tajikistan? No, she's going to talk about the place where she lived most of her life. So. After you spend about a hundred years in the spiritual world, somebody asks you where you're from, you think you're going to be talking about your hometown? You're going to forget where the hell you were on earth. Where, did, where was I born, man? I, I don't know, you know. It's all a matter of perspective, you know. You've been on this physical earth so long you can't imagine otherwise, but you know, our life on earth is a drop in the bucket of the ocean compared to our life in spirit world. Put it simply, this is not your real life. This is not your real life. Spirit world, that's where you really live. That's your eternal home. That's where you really live. This is just like being in the womb again. Just drier. Dry and a little bit longer. Um, it's all just preparing for the next stage of life. Now think of the, now, where we said, you know, a child in the womb has to develop ability to breathe air because you're living in an environment of air in the physical world. The environment in the spirit world is an environment of love. So therefore your ability to love is going to determine where you live in the spirit world. Now, whereas a child, a child, if the child did, could not breathe, comes into the physical world, he, he can't live. But your spirit is eternal, so your spirit's going to live anyway, you know, too late. You know, you have a spirit self, you live forever, end of story. But where you live, what kind of environment you live in, that will be determined by your ability to love. How much you can love others, how much you can't how much your heart is like God or not. The more your heart is like God, the closer you are to God. The higher the place, the brighter, the more beautiful. The less your heart is like God, darker, colder, more miserable. And one of the things, and Father wasn't the only one who said this. Many people already figured this out before. Whereas a lot of Christians or other people, if they believe in you know, heaven or hell or whatever, they think that God decides where you go. No. You do. You've decided before you die, actually, by the actions of your, of your physical life. I'll give you an example. Whenever there's, stop sometime, whenever there's like a public gathering, right, you've got free time just to hang around. You know, nothing special to do. It's a rare moment. I know, it's really hard to find those things. You don't have a particular team to be with or something. What happens in those situations is that people tend to, you tend to gravitate and hang around 
people that you feel comfortable with. Right? Other people I like to be with. Other people I feel comfortable with. These are the people that I'll be with. What you can see sometimes, we have people you might refer to as cane type people. Cane type people means they have a tendency to be kind of, you know, negative, cynical, resentful, whatever. They happen to group together. You know, like a fungus, anyway. Um, they always find each other somehow, even if they didn't know each other, somehow. They group together. And other people may be more, and I don't even want to say able type, anyway, people who are more positive minded or more friendly or whatever, they'll be together. It's just naturally, right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, now, if you see that kind of situation, see the people that you are with and think, if I die right now, these are the people I'm going to be living with forever. These kind of people. You have just decided where you're most comfortable. And where you're most comfortable is where your spirit will go. That's just reality. Someone who's very, someone who's very cynical and resentful, this kind of person, can they endure, can they be comfortable with people who are smiling and embracing? You have this kind of attitude, you know, I'm sick of this shit, and you know, fuck that, and you know, and someone comes over to you, hi, how are you? And they're smiling, they want to embrace you. How do you respond? Get off me! Asshole. Get away from me! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Guess what? You leave me alone, people. When you go to Sport World, anybody guess? Anybody? Want to say it? You will be alone. And not because people are staying away from you. It's because people couldn't get close to you if they tried. Because they tried on earth and you wouldn't let them then either. In spirit world, it's impossible. That's reality. In good spirit world, good spirit world is a place where everybody is welcoming and opening. There are no such things as strangers. Even if you've never seen a person before, you see them, you feel you want to be with this person. Every door is open. You go to a house in spirit world, you knock just as a way of saying hello, you can open it. No one's going to say, wait until I open it, you're invading my privacy. In good spirit world, there is no such thing. You know? Come in, whatever, you know. You want some food? Here, take it. You don't even have to worry if I'm home. It's like that. But a selfish-minded person or a resentful kind of person, he couldn't even feel comfortable in such a place. Everybody's smiling at me. What are you looking at me for? Leave me alone! <laughs> they can't be there. They can't, naturally, they can't go there. They will naturally go to a place that fits their mood. Do you ever notice, you know, there, if you see in, in a big city, you'll see, you know, some very dirty, smelly kind of bum or something. Is this guy going to hang out in, you know, very bright, clean neighborhoods? Especially bright neighborhoods. Does this dirty, smelly bum want to hang out in a bright neighborhood? No, because it's bright, then it's obvious that he's not clean, you know? It's obvious, the more bright it is, the more obvious he's dirty. So he'll go to a darker place where there's less light. That's where he feels more comfortable. Spirit world is the same like that. So it's all decided by your, your standard of love, your ability to love, and you decide where you go. And that means forever. And of course, we, you know, if you know more about principle, you know that there's returning resurrection, that even you did not reach perfection spiritually, there are things that can be done. You can come back and we're through someone on earth in order to try to, you know, to finish this. Don't put your bets on this, okay? <laughs> it's all right, I screw up now and I don't reach perfection now. It's all right, anyway, I'll come back. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't put your bets on this. Because it's gonna be hard, painful, and insanely long. But as much as you can grow spiritually in a day on earth, it takes about a hundred years in the spirit world. And a hundred years, if you're in a miserable place, feels like about a hundred thousand. 
I mean, did you ever notice when you were sick? Does time crawl when you're sick? You know, if you're sick and awake, ever been in the hospital? And you're sick, miserable, and awake, you can't sleep? A minute feels like an hour. That's hell. If you're miserable, you know, a day feels like a year. So it's not, it's not, a, not a thing to bet on. I'll do it when I, after I die. It's all right. I'll get resurrected. It's not going to work. Okay. All right, any, any question about this? I knew I would go over. Anyway. Any question here? So one of the ironic things, I love this. You go back to this. The purpose and value of man's physical life is absolutely nothing physical. <laughs> there nothing physical. Purpose of your physical life is to develop your spirit and to make more spirits, means have babies. It does involve physical action to fulfill it. But there's no physical purpose whatsoever, no physical material purpose to this life at all. It's all spiritual. That's kind of a cool thing. Okay. No question? Any complaints from Asha? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Complaint? No, no. I have one more question. It's about everyday refinancing. Last condition I said my name is Papo. Petty to love. It's about when I approach a customer, customer, no sort of thing. There's something very complaining. Uh, store some injection. Uh, I feel something. Okay, ignore. You know, sometimes miserable. Sometimes uh, miserable. Uh, I want to say to me, to me, I didn't get it to love uh, for customer. <laughs> I think for if he go to the sweet brother, maybe he just a good. The land, not good for spirit. How to do we kind of deeply to love people, to better to love, keep him. Of course, he didn't know about it. Uh, um, what he is, what he do. But we know that we cannot do better to love. How about either he goes to work, uh, we, I can do. Anyway, in those in those situations, it's more impor it's important not to just ignore them. You want to be able to even take even just a moment, even just a moment to pray for them. You know, to even though he said something nasty to you, you have only some good wish or good intention towards him. You know, and that makes it that makes a big difference, even for him. That makes a difference. Uh, he might not notice it, maybe. But the spirit world will notice it. Uh, but that's, that's, that's important. Because if sometimes you just ignore, anyway, it's okay, it's okay. But you might have some, some lingering bad feeling there. And that's not good for either one of you. So you have to always make sure you, you leave that situation with actually something positive, one way or the other. Um, and that, that, that'll be good for both of you. Because if he, if you know, when people reject you, and you get upset, he just committed two sins. <laughs> no, his attitude in rejecting you was one, and now you became kind of negative or resentful. There's two, and he's got to pay for both. So you know, you don't want to do that. That's our main visit on weekends. First thing you do is go where? Anybody know? Hell. You got some witnessing to do, man. No? You have no excuse. Who's the first guy who did that, by the way? Jesus. <laughs> Died. First thing he did, went to hell. That sucks, but you know. 
That's the responsibility. Okay, yeah. Um, my question is kind of related to his on the fundraising experience. Because all of us were going out fundraising, and I kind of put my cap on the spot a couple of times with this question to see if you can answer it. But um, we base our level of spiritual growth on a result. Is that true or false? It's not an absolute. It's not absolute. It's not an absolute, no way. Yeah. <laughs> not an absolute, no. There's because there's always an internal side. You you have to see the attitude. You have to see the attitude of the attitude of the fundraiser, and there's other things going on, other situations that happen to them. Um, no, it's not an absolute thing. It's it's some indicator, but by itself, no. It's, it doesn't indicate everything. Because there's some guys who are complete assholes and they're good salesmen. <laughs> they made good money, you know, and then they go to hell. Um. <laughs> but you can tell by other things. You can tell, you know. There, there are many other things that'll tell you something. Light, sunlight. Light, yes. So does it mean that a person, for a person, any of, uh, like gets it uh, unconditionally all the time, indirectly or directly? Uh, no, it means, means that it is, it's been given and it's available to receive. In terms of God's truth, through history, God has been giving, right? Giving His word, giving His truth. And uh, we didn't have to necessarily go and, you know, we don't have to make it ourselves, you know. No, 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 no. Okay. Truth is something that's it's available, like the principle. You know, it's there, it's given to us, and we receive it. In a sense, it's not something that we have to create. You know, it's something that's given. Um, it's not something that we just stand there and I'm receiving truth. You know, through through the air. And the same with love, in terms of parental love. Parental love is something that's that's given to us through our parents. You know, we don't go and make that. It's something that's that's already been given to us from our parents. Yeah, but we can develop only wh when we get it, like we receive it all the time. Yeah. So it doesn't mean every day we receive it unconditionally. That's not like vital element. I shouldn't do anything for for this. No, no, no. And I, it's 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 not in that you're receiving it all the time, and that it's there. It's there for you to receive. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to make it. You know, you have the principle. But you can't just like hold the principal book and receive the truth, right? You have to read it, right? At least, at least that. But in the sense of that, we didn't have to go and find the truth, or we didn't have to go and create it. And the same with parental love. Your parents gave that to you already, you know. And if they're still alive, they're still giving it to you. Um, if they're not, they're still giving it to you. Uh, it's something that you're in a position to receive. You don't have to ask for it. It's it's like that. Ah, uh, okay. <sighs> I'm sorry. Yeah, in terms in terms of God's love, God's love is expressed to us through one way that is always expressed to us is through the creation. That's one sure way that it's always there. How much we're able to perceive it, that's as I was saying, depending on your ability to give. So yes, in that sense, it's it's always there. And then through different circumstances, through different people or whatever, there's expressions in that love. But that love, that, that love that allows us to grow, that's specifically parental love. These other things, those are other, exp other expressions of love. The parental love that allows us to grow, that's directly what comes from our parents. Doesn't quite answer your question, does it? Ah, uh, you see, there's another thing. It depends on, see, it's the same. 
this word and that's where it comes to when you talk about the blessing or something like that to the blessing we in the blessing we are accepting two parents as our parents and we are then receiving true parental love from them in the blessing but it's it's a willful it's a willful act so for for a kid in an orphanage it depends who he chose as his parents who he who he decides as his parents and they accept him in some way as their child in the sense of loving them as if this was my child so even if the kid was adopted or not you don't know there could be somebody who was working in that place who loved this kid as their child and he always saw this as my mom even in that to that extent he'll receive parental love it's very tough it's very limited, but it's a, it's a willful thing. If you accept this person as your parents, they accept you as your child, you know, there you go, as your parents. So it's not, in a sense, it's not, we're not limited to just who our physical parents are. That's the important thing about, about salvation through true parents. Well, that's a different story, bigger story. But it's a good, good question, important question. Anything else? I've gone way over time now. Okay, who's going to pray to finish?